The lectures that I have been giving are uh, a work in progress. That's the first thing that I want to say. They're exploratory and they're tentative. If you weren't here last night, uh, hopefully you won't be lost tonight. I think tonight's talk is freestanding and there will be enough in it to argue about at the end. Uh, but they are exploratory for me, and this one I think is more exploratory than last night's even. So bear that in mind. It was an ordinary Sunday afternoon in the Anderson household a few years back, full of books and tea and other comforts. My wife had momentarily interrupted my reading by giving me a kiss, seemingly without cause. It captured just the sort of warm affection one hopes for after a decade of marriage. Delighted, I did what I thought every husband would do, but should probably never do, and asked her what it was for. Her, re her response conveyed the same care, though not quite in the form I'd hoped. Sometimes we get what we don't deserve, she responded, <laughs> as she walked away. She's right about that. <laughs> What's better about that, that you just have to know, is that my wife is named Charity. So it just works on so many levels. <laughs> she hates that I just said that. Like, she, I'm glad she's not here. She would not be pleased. In these talks, I'm trying to sketch how a Christian might think about justice in our context. My proposal last night was that justice is insufficient as a virtue. When untethered from the gospel, justice breeds injustice by demanding compensation for wrongdoing that requires the sacrifice of new innocence. Yet I also noted that if we begin with the gospel in trying to understand justice, we risk not speaking of it at all. Now abide these three, faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is charity. If charity is the realm of giving and receiving what is not deserved, as my wife made clear to me that Sunday afternoon, then we are in something of a bind. It's hard to see how charity might clarify or illumine justice, except by contradicting it. If justice gives what is owed, charity gives what is not owed, either by forgiving debts or bestowing superfluous gifts. In this light, the gospel and justice seem like non-overlapping domains. They are two worlds between which there is no commerce. The difficulties of seeing how justice, uh, excuse me, how charity might inform justice transform into outright dangers though, if we allow it a place in our politics. It is all well and good to speak of charity within the church, it is another matter altogether, though, if we speak of it as animating the state. The state has no authority to compel its citizens to give to their neighbor beyond what our neighbor is due. When the state presumes it has such an authority, it takes on the atmosphere of tyranny. The state's compulsion of its citizens to do more for their neighbor than they are owed undermines charity by eliminating the freedom that seems so central to it. The state that appeals to charity in its works can only destroy it. Better to limit the state to justice and allow charity to remain between individuals and their God. Now, these are not the sort of worries that uh, one giving a talk like this should ignore. But that's what I'm going to do. The decision to sidestep them is not entirely arbitrary, though it might be a little arbitrary. Answering them properly requires, I think, understanding charity's nature and scope. As I did last night, I turn for this task to the two great triads of the Old and New Testaments. As faith is the root of justice, so God's exhortation that we would walk humbly with him is the heart of charity. Humility 
is the astringent love needs to be purified from its political dangers. The only wisdom we can hope to acquire, T.S. Eliot writes, is the wisdom of humility. Humility is endless. The endlessness of charity is in fact where our reflections must begin. Faith and hope will pass away while charity remains. Hope that is seen is not hope, Paul tells the Romans. The partial knowledge of faith will cease, he tells the Corinthians. But charity abides and is greater than these. Charity endures into the consummation of creation at Christ's second advent, an event that has its origins in his first. In this way, charity provides us here and now a foretaste and a glimpse of the joys of God's own eternal life. Charity sums up all the virtues, but goes beyond them. Charity never ends, never runs out, and never fails. The New Testament can emphatically order the moral life around love because it has glimpsed our consummation and our joy in a way the old has not. It has seen the death and resurrection of the Messiah and so knows in part what form charity takes. Yet because charity endures into eternity, it orders our affections and our acts towards the blessedness and perfection of our neighbor. Charity seeks their flourishing. It takes joy in the fulfillment of our neighbor's capacities and powers as a person made in God's image. Charity honors our neighbor's sanctity by giving them what they need and more beside. Yet in meeting our neighbor's needs, charity is an act of communication. It arises from the recognition of our common humanity and gives out of a person's own for the sake of the other's flourishing. This gift of the person frees the other from any obligation to reciprocate. Charity lends without new debts being formed. It gives without receiving. In this way, charity is disinterested. It remains unself-conscious about a possible return or reward for its deeds. Love seeks not its own to the point that it welcomes secrecy in its works. Love never boasts. Neither let your left hand know what your right hand is doing when giving to those in need, Jesus tells us in the Sermon on the Mount, lest you become like the hypocrites who practice their righteousness before others to be seen by those around them. Jesus heals the sick and then demands their silence. The non-reciprocal gift of charity, though, is also ordered toward establishing a common fellowship between us and our neighbor. It engenders peace. The love of God shed abroad in our hearts through the Holy Spirit is the fruit of the peace with God that Christ Jesus secures for us. The peace of God is not only the cessation of hostility between us and God, but the security that comes from being drawn through adoption into God's own inner life, and so being protected therein from every danger and harm. The peace of God is a terrible good. Its absence from our lives generates sin, even as our sin destroys peace. The peace charity pursues with its neighbors is like unto this. It is a bulwark against social decay as it secures people in the confidence that their neighbor really will do good unto them as they do good unto their neighbor. The social peace charity invigorates aims not only at the elimination of strife and conflict, but our, at our enjoyment of a common life and common goods. It seeks not only justification, we might say, but real reconciliation. 
as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men, Paul tells the Romans just before proceeding to the chapter on just governance. Live peaceably with all men, though, he says. The more excellent way of charity quickens the church, uniting the members of Christ's body in the bonds of peace. Yet the porousness of the church's boundaries demands that we re remain alive to the demands our neighbors make upon us everywhere we encounter them. And which one of these proved a neighbor to his fellow who fell among the robbers? So goes Jesus' question to those who would try to escape the injunction to love their neighbor as they love their God. The parable is well known to us, as is the point. The Samaritan's kindness emerges through his indifference to the social and racial boundaries that prevented others from assisting their distressed neighbor. Yet the parable's frame also limits charity's scope in ways off, not often noted. As it happened one day, Jesus says, by chance, in the ordinary course of events, a neighbor intrudes upon the Samaritan's course and tests his love. The scope of charity is bound by the contingent bonds that hold us. It is governed by providence and requires us to make peace with our near neighbors before we aid those far away. It is no accident that Jesus exhorts us in the Sermon on the Mount to leave our offering and make peace with our brother before continuing our worship. It's almost like he understands where enmity begins. The attentiveness charity takes to those who are nearest to us is a recognition of our limits. We are bound to the places that we live and lead lives that are, that are determined by those immediately around us. Charity respects the limits of our creaturely life. It ties us to creation and recognizes that we are given a place and a time in which we live responsibly before God. The emphasis on the contingent and accidental accidental bonds within which charity is formed draws us near, I think, to God's command to walk humbly with him. The Hebrew word Micah deploys in this verse resists translation. The one can see why the Septuagint and later Christians opted for humility to render it. The term connotes a judiciousness that submits to counsel a discriminating care that is akin to something like modesty. There is a strong practical or deliberative dimension to the concept, which suggests it indicates a kind of wisdom. The term is thus distinct from how we commonly think of humility. It indicates a glad embrace of direction and guidance, rather than a reluctance to boast or a refusal to think more highly of ourselves than we ought. We might say that the judiciousness and care of wisdom is attentive to the limits of our knowledge. It prioritizes in our discernment those who know the world better than us by learning to love our nearest neighbors without pretending we can equally understand those whose lives are not as intimate with our own. I think something like this is the humility before God we're commanded to walk in. This emphasis of attending to those near us within wisdom and humility is infused into charity by the disclosure of God's love for humanity in Jesus Christ. By this, John writes, we know love, that God first loved us and laid down his life for us. We can only think about loving our neighbor truly by constantly returning to this center and source. The humility of God is more glorious than the glory of men. The weakness of God is stronger than the strength of men. In the cross, God exposes the wisdom of this world as folly. He shames the wisdom of the wise, Paul writes. It is a stunning repudiation of the pretensions of humanity to understand and inaugurate the kingdom 
on our own terms. The distinction between God and humanity in creation is transformed into a division by our sin. The hostility of humanity to God can only be overcome by the humiliation of Jesus Christ. Here, upon the cross, is love vast as an ocean, loving kindness as a flood. God walks in humility with man, that man might walk humbly with God. When we walk within this endless wisdom of humility, we learn to see our own life together with our neighbors before God. Practically, I think this means that we learn to defer our moral judgments upon our neighbor until we have thoroughly considered our own lives beneath the same framework. If charity binds us together in love, then we will do unto others as we would have done unto us. And the manner in which we judge others will the, be the manner in which we are judged. Jesus' command to judge not is the epistemic corollary of the golden rule. Both disclose the deep equality at the heart of charity, which is founded upon the common humanity we share before God. Yet this understanding of charity and its equality transfigures justice. Behind Jesus' command to judge not lies the lex talionis, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. The principle of equal restitution limits the otherwise voracious demand for compensation by victims. The very mercy of the law cries out, Shakespeare's measure for measure announces, most audible even from his proper tongue. Haste still pays haste, and leisure answer, answers leisure. Like doth quit like, and measure still for measure. Living within the wise humility of God means cultivating a discriminating prudence that sees how our own lives are bound by the standards we would impose upon others. The justice of charity remembers that those whom we judge are our neighbors and our fellows, and that we are bound with them beneath God's judgment of us both. We must make a decision. The world can only go on if we close the case and make a limited and provisional judgment between right and wrong. But we are directed to consider the plank in our own eye because in judging one another and in making this decision, we name the shape of a flourishing life that governs our own lives as well. Communally, the same principle of deferring judgment applies. Judgment begins at the house of God. If the church is authorized to announce the shape of justice within the gospel of Jesus Christ, as I think it is, it will only issue this judgment authoritatively if it has already submitted itself to the very judgment that it announces. At the same time, the common fellowship we share as humans in moral judgment beneath the grace of God means that our charitable concern for our neighbor has a reflexive quality to it. Grace is echoed by grace, and charity breeds charity. When we are merciful, mercy falls upon us. The goods we give in charity are not diminished or lost to us. They return to us, and in so doing, increase. Abundance is the iron law of the kingdom of God. The gifts of charity are multiplied in being given, as the fish and loaves are multiplied by Christ. The infinite plenitude of God's love, which never fails and never runs dry, leaves no grounds for envy. Because it's not a zero-sum game. Charity is free to rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep because it lives within a blessedness nothing can touch. 
neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth it's a long list nor any other created thing even can separate us from the infinite love of God in Christ. The gifts within God's good creation to us and the surpassing greatness of his gift of himself in our redemption mean that in our humanity, we stand as debtors before God. What do you have that you did not receive? Paul asked the Corinthians. We, the poor and the outcasts from God's kingdom, live even now within the luxury of his love, which ever increases and ever grows world without end. Blessed are the poor, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. The presence of the poor within the church is a witness to the abundance of God's love. The church in welcoming the poor makes visible the common joy available to us within the kingdom of God. It gives the world a glimpse of the end of history in which charity prevails and endures. It invites us to a feast of blessing and of fellowship in which the last are first and the first last. But the church does not only welcome the poor, she accompanies them in their alienation from society as Christ accompanies us in our alienation from God. The beatitude of, their, of the poor and the meek is inseparable from the presence of the church within their midst. Through such presence, those who are alienated learn the language of lament for the injustices they suffer and experience the alleviation of their distress through participating in the common life of the new community. Through the church's witness to charity then, those who are disadvantaged are folded up into the abundance of God's riches and what seems to be the basis for their humiliation proves instead to be the grounds for their glory. What though might this account of charity have to do with justice and especially with the state's responsibility to secure it? Properly speaking, Bearing witness to the charity God's redemption makes possible remains the work of the church. There can be no easy or direct derivation from the church's rule of love to the state's task of securing justice. The two institutions have a common authority but distinct ends. They both bear witness to God's work but in different ways. The church provides a glimpse of the beatitude to which humanity is ordered while the state secures a peace that allows such beatitude to be enjoyed. The church's evangelistic efforts depend in part on the state's preservation of this peace. The Roman Empire could not last as it was founded on the injustice of pagan sacrifices rather than upon the justice of Christ's death and resurrection. But the Roman government unintentionally and unwittingly carried forward the seeds of its own destruction and renewal when it crucified our savior and sent Paul to Rome. We are told by Paul to pray for those in authority so that we quote, might lead peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness for this is good and pleases our savior who desires that all might be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. In God's providential ordering of the world, the kingdom's growth occurs primarily through the quiet and peaceful faithfulness of God's people rather than the spectacular witness of our martyrdom. The distinction between these institutions, that of the church and the state though, means the church must say no to any attempt by the state to mimic charity without submitting to the kingly direction of Jesus. As justice outside the gospel breeds injustice, so charity absent Christ can only breed inhumanity. 
Philanthropy that is founded upon an abstract commitment to the universal brotherhood of humanity can only generate a distant, indifferent form of action that denies the poor the very thing they need most, our presence with and for them. The church can be present among the poor as Christ is present among us by accompanying them in a humility that submits to their counsel about their own needs as Christ really hears and responds to our prayers. Such a presence with the poor means that within the work of charity, we give our time and not only our resources. We meet needs within the communication of love, care, and concern, rather than out of an abstract commitment to the needs of the poor. Only through close proximity to our neighbor will we be able to truly and fully discern the shape of their flourishing. George MacDonald's Robert Falconer critiques a would-be philanthropist who would give her money without her time on these grounds. But it is, it is right to do many things for the poor when you know him, which it would not be right to do for them until you know them, he says. I am amongst them. They know me. Their children know me. And something is always occurring that makes this or that one come to me. Once I have a footing, I seldom lose it. So you see, in this my labor, I am content to do the thing that lies next to me. I wait events. Note the emphasis on his nearness to those whom he takes responsibility for. Like the good Samaritan, he is, he is with his neighbor while serving him. The alternative form of charity is an impersonal and uninvolved philanthropy that parodies the disinterestedness of true charity by denying our presence to those to whom we would give our money. Such a form of philanthropy, Falconer suggests, is the offspring of our mammon worship. It gives money, but it will not give ourselves. At the same time, the church's practices of charity do have something to teach the state about justice and its contents. We might reprise the above themes by transposing them into an explicitly political key. Take, for instance, charity's form of a judicious humility, a willingness to remain under counsel in discerning what we ought to do. A state that walks humbly ought to defer as much as it can to those institutions that most pervasively encompass and form persons. The state's deference to parents in the formation of children, for instance, is founded upon its recognition of the intrinsic goods of family life. In giving parents the freedom to make decisions for their children's well-being, the state acknowledges limits on both its own authority and competence to secure the goods children need. Note that in doing so, the state might be forced to make a compromise and allow what some would suggest is a source of real injustice. As an institution that secures goods across generations, as I argued last night, the family is a bastion of social and economic inequality. Yet family life is so comprehensive and so central to our formation as persons that families need the freedom to cultivate and enjoy the goods of a common life so that children can cultivate their own capabilities within an environment of love and affection. A modest state respects the astonishing potency of the family to bring about flourishing ind individuals and defers judgment about how such communities arrange their lives to parents. The gospel relativizes every institution's claim over us, including the families, by placing us directly beneath the command of God. But a state that has learned charity from 
this witness, defers its judgment about the good of its citizens to those who are nearest to them. Second, a state that has learned modesty prioritizes its competence to judge wrongs rather than determine and compel particular or definite visions of the good. Wrongs engender a cry for restitution that is infinite, but they are more easily identifiable, excuse me, they're more easily identifiable for this than specific arrangements about the right. Killing is a discrete act that has a beginning and an end, which makes it possible for the state to determine whether it constitutes murder. But the goods a society might decide to pursue are boundless and indeterminate. Tolstoy, I'm afraid, had it all wrong. There are an infinite number of ways for a family to be happy, as there are a nearly infinite variety of ways we could arrange our society. The state exercises a cautious discretion by limiting its power to judging against the wrongs human beings inflict upon each other, rather than allowing itself to compel people to pursue concrete goods. By limiting its task this way, the state can avoid the temptation to seize the kingdom of God for its own and attempt to bring it about by force. By judging wrongs, the state preserves the social trust needed for a flourishing society to emerge organically. The state prunes and weeds wrongs and vice, we might say, and in that way preserves the possibility of beatitude among, among its citizens by leaving room both for their agency and for the many institutions that stand between the state and the individual. In learning modesty from the witness of the church, the state sees the dangers of trespassing its limits. We know when a state walks humbly with God, when it avoids the pretense that the kingdom lies within its grasp and limits its direction of society to judging wrongdoing. However, the sharpest limits of the state's competence and its most urgent need for modesty arise when we consider matters of belief and conviction about the claims God makes upon humanity. The state's acknowledgement of its limits preserves the freedom for individuals and communities to worship and practice as God would have them do, namely, freely. The value of non-coercion in matters of faith and worship is itself a theological principle. It is not obvious that God would view compulsion in matters of faith as intrinsically incompatible with true religion. But God honors the freedom of the creature in setting humanity free in Jesus Christ. The state that preserves freedom for others to worship honors them in the same way. The coercive direction of the state in matters of religion is simply hubris. A state that purports to determine the the appropriate shape of worship loses the humility that the witness of charity engenders. A state that has heard and responded to the gospel must be a liberal state, for it lives within and affirms the liberality of God's grace in allowing individuals to spurn him if they wish. Freedom is necessary fl for flourishing then, but freedom has a shape. The freedom of the creature consists in our correspondence and conformity to the order God has laid down in creation and redemption. The state's determination of the wrongs it judges will only be just to the extent that it comports to the bounded ordered freedom of the creature. Charity rejoices in the truth, Paul says. The state must be interested in the real flourishing of persons rather than merely providing us an undifferentiated space to do whatever we might desire. The state's embrace of a judicious humility in deferring decisions about matters of religious belief and practice to its citizens, to its citizens cannot be a radical rejection of any form of judgment as the function of the mind is to come to partial limited conclusions, so the function of the state is to determine how citizens have wronged each other. 
the principle of religious liberty is not inviolable. In respecting the limits of its competence, the state must look to determine whether wrongs are inflicted under the umbrella of religion that do fall within its competence. But this responsibility can only be exercised judiciously and cautiously in the humility that it has no competence to determine the truth or falsity of what religious communities believe and practice. The state's failure to love the truth in determining the wrongs of the society it is over can only lead to the expulsion of the freedom it is meant to protect. If charity without humility sanctions an aggressive paternalism that comes near tyranny, so humility without truth comes to a similar end. The state's protection of freedom for its citizens must honor the truth about the person and their flourishing, because when this dimension of charity flees, freedom will eventually flee as well. At the heart of every tyranny lies an embrace of falsehood. Lies require increasingly elaborate, coercive, and expensive webs to maintain, as the totalitarianism of North Korea's current regime reveals. This means, though, that the state's purview to judge wrongs is broader than it might seem, and extends into arenas where many of us think it can only do more harm than good by getting involved. The state's responsibility to pursue justice, for instance, includes addressing the injustices that give rise to systemic imbalances in a marketplace that restrict the agency of individuals and communities. An economy should be ordered toward, the cult uh, toward cultivating the freedom of persons to enjoy the goods of God's creation and to cultivate their capacities as persons made in God's image. A free market in this way is a great good, for it offers us a wide degree of latitude to enjoy those goods and cultivate our capacities as we deem fit. But economies are political. This is a hard thing to say. They are political and not purely material. Commercial exchanges in a marketplace are moments of communication between institutions and persons through which we can inflict injuries upon our neighbors. We can defraud them. Additionally, People cannot be participants in a social order if their material want prevents them from cultivating their capacities. An individual cannot take personal responsibility for themselves, much less their neighbor, if they do not have food or shelter and cannot get them. A community that distorted its economy by preventing certain individuals from creating multi-generational wealth, say, hypothetically, on the basis of race, is an unjust one in this respect. But naming this as an injustice no way under, in no way undermines the responsibilities of individuals to pursue their own flourishing, nor does it commit us necessarily to a doctrine of equal opportunity which risks impinging on the family's position as the central institution for the formation of a virtuous and just citizenry. But it does enjoin the state, I think, to take seriously the possibility of injustice in matters of trade and exchange. And it demands we oppose the alienation of disadvantaged individuals from the structures of governance that happens when political access and power become dependent upon material prosperity and wealth. If we can, if only the poor can uh, enact political change, or excuse me, if only the wealthy can enact political change, that's, that's a deep injustice. If justice is responsive to the order of God's good creation, we are owed, I think, 
the fruits of our labor to such a degree that we can support our lives and the lives of those who depend upon us. That those who are impoverished go on having more children despite their condition is, in this way, a sign of their deep faith in the luxuriousness of God's love and a witness to the inherently interpersonal quality of goods that fundamentally make up our flourishing. Poverty and wealth may be material, but our happiness is finally dependent upon our freedom to enjoy the goods of creation within the common union of loving bonds. We ought not have to choose between these, between sustenance and having a family. But if we do, the poor are right to choose as they do and to go on having children. Wealth serves a community or will destroy it. We cannot serve two masters. All this is to say that the state must recognize and resist the boastful pride of life that John warns against. The voracious appetite for the appearance of economic prosperity, which the vice names, that animates so much of bourgeois middle-class American culture has been satisfied through an extraordinary accumulation of debt. We in the middle classes have borrowed much to secure our way of life, including to go to this university. Preserving the appearance of economic comfort and ease has required financing opportunities for ourselves that the lower classes have not had access to, stratifying our society and creating the conditions for social and political alienation and division. The white working class's rebellion against this social stratification through Donald Trump has been well documented. But this rebellion is now taking the form of a counter reaction towards socialism among educated progressive millennials. For many conservative Christians, the growing popularity of socialist ideas arises from a sense of resentment and envy among millennials and an unwillingness to take responsibility for their lives. But if envy is breeding the desire for economic equ equality, millennials learned that particular vice in the bourgeois neighborhoods we grew up in, dominated as they were by the boastful pride of life. The failure of one generation leads to abuses in the next. If conservative evangelicals wish to resist socialism, as I think we ought, we must begin by examining the planks within our own eyes. Charity toward our millennial neighbor demands judgment begin at our own bank accounts. Socialism is not so much a cure that is worse than the disease as it is the inevitable perpetuation of one of America's founding vices. As I observed last night, God visits the sins of parents upon their children and uses the children to judge the sins of the parents. He really, really does. The alienation of America's lower classes, though, and the rampant loneliness and isolation of our society are deep problems that should trouble all of us. A public policy aimed at establishing the conditions for disadvantaged groups to have agency might be animated by class warfare, by the envy of the weak for the strong, but it might also be guided by an interest in preventing the violence that often erupts when social groups are alienated from each other. Even so, the state's public policies in addressing these problems will not be enough to overcome the loneliness and isolation that afflicts us, nor is it enough to give our neighbor our votes on their behalf if we will not also give them our time. Within our technocratic society, meritocratic elites 
on both sides of our political aisle wash their hands of our social problems by issuing very good, very reasonable policy solutions to alleviate poverty without themselves living in, with, and among the very poor they would claim to defend. There are political versions of the vices that arise from our mammon worship, and a socialism that would seek to overcome poverty on strictly economic terms might be among them. But the social problem of poverty is an interpersonal problem. Real persons are alienated from institutions, and the life of those institutions is diminished without their presence. Our community is worse, not better, if it has no members of the lower classes within it. Yet the social stratification of our society ensures that we rarely encounter our impoverished neighbor on our way to work or the grocery store or the like, at least that we know of. The alleviation of poverty requires our presence and the communication of our respect and our care to our fellow. It is a work that cannot be done from a distance. Pub public policies that are attentive to the dangers that arise when alienation takes root should seek to increase the social and geographical proximity of those who have means and those who do not. And those interested in preserving the individual's freedom to act charitably should be first among us to overcome the infrequent opportunities we have to encounter our neighbors with needs in the ordinary course of our lives. The poor, by and large, remain invisible to us because we do not live among them, nor allow them to live among us. To these social and political dimensions of charity, I add one final suggestion. As charity gives us a taste of blessedness, it empowers us to be joyful, even in the midst of hostility and hatred. Blessed are you when they persecute you and say all manner of evil against you for my sake. Rejoice and be glad for in the same way they persecuted the prophets before you. Man is more himself, man is more manlike when joy is the fundamental thing in him and grief the superficial, Chesterton said. Christ's cry of sorrow on the cross is the wellspring of comedy. His humiliation is the origin of all humor. As Chesterton noted, Christ hid his mirth from us in his incarnation. His joy is too tremendous and too terrible to be seen in this world. And this joy has a political edge. The Lord who sits in the heavens laughs the nations to scorn. He scoffs at them, exposing their pretensions to inaugurate the kingdom of God as vanity. The absence of anything approaching humor or joy in our public discourse is, I think, another profound indicator of how our society is becoming post-Christian. Neither the progressive left nor the conservative right seem to be having a very good time. They are incapable of laughing at themselves and aren't particularly good at satirizing each other. They are consumed by a spite that forgets we are bound together as neighbors before God and so have lost the levity required for an argument to delight even as it cuts. In this way as well, a post-Christian despair seems to have seized us. Who has time for rest or for merriment when there's injustice around and a culture war to be fought? The answer, of course, is Christians. The luxury of the kingdom of God is so vast that God demands we devote an entire day to enjoying it. In the Sabbath, God gives us time that we had taken from him by sin. He commands us to rejoice, rest, and enjoy the fruits of our labor and of the kingdom of God. 
Within the Sabbath, we are set free within the limits of our creaturely life. And we learn to love those limits as the keys to our own flourishing. On the Sabbath, we experience a foretaste of the beatitude that we shall someday enjoy world without end. The Sabbath means we may work without the anxiety that comes over us if we must build the kingdom of God by our own hands, as it reminds us that the rest to which our lives are ordered will finally be given to us by the gracious God. The work of charity in the church, then, in its practice of taking a Sabbath, has something to teach the world about how it conducts its business. Neither the contents of justice nor the work of the state can be hermetically sealed from the contents of the gospel. Dividing the gospel from justice tears asunder what God has joined together. Yet within their union, there is distinction. For justice to remain justice, it must be qualified by charity and embrace the judicious humility that the virtue inculcates within us. A government that has thus learned charity secures the freedom of all its citizens to arrange their lives before God and honors them as persons by deferring to them the power to organize society around the goods they wish to have in common. The Christian state knows it stands beneath the judgment of God and so limits its own judgment to the wrongs we inflict upon one, one another but it also really judges those wrongs and so preserves the possibility of social trust. The humility that emerges when a society hears and responds to the gospel frees us to cultivate our agency and to enjoy the goods of God's creation together, uniting us with our neighbor wherever we find him in the bonds of peace. Thank you. Well, there you are. Uh, we have some time for questions. Come at me. Uh, I said it was exploratory. I look forward to your challenges, your critiques. Uh, I know it was a lot. It's a rather dense paper, if I may say so. Uh, and so if you need clarification, feel free to push me on that as well. Uh, fire away. Yeah, go. Yeah, how does the church teach the state the justice of the gospel? Um, by writing angry letters, sending tweets, um, uh, knocking on the doors of our senators and representatives, uh, encouraging, fostering, supporting local uh, candidates for local government. Um, you know, Augustine uh, writes a letter to the emperor and is like, hey, you're doing this all wrong. And I think that's actually the right sort of way uh, that the church teaches the state what the limits of its responsibility are. So I think you know, there, whatever the means of communication are within a society are the means of communication a church uh, may reach for and employ in teaching the state its job. Does that help? OK, good. Yeah, go. Yeah, when talking about poverty. Good. So when I think about poverty, I think of poverty not only in material terms, right? Uh, and I don't want to have a, any kind of distinction between a material poverty or a, uh, the social dimensions of that, right? When we think about poverty and material resources, what we're talking about are the conditions for agency, right? The conditions for people to uh, make choices and to act in ways that would be conducive to their own flourishing. And to the extent that they're impoverished, they lack the resources they need to make those choices. But their inability to make those choices is fundamentally a social problem, right? Where the person who cannot make those choices is um, uh, disconnected from the community uh, that they are meant to be a part of to the extent that they cannot make those choices. And so from my standpoint, any kind of remedy for poverty has to communicate the right sort of thing. So I don't think I'm trying to say that policies don't matter, right? To the extent that there are um, uh, prohibitions, for instance, uh, that would prevent those without means from starting their own businesses. 
I think we should eliminate those. So the licensing regime is a serious problem, right? So if you don't have means and you say practice really hard at cutting hair and you become quite good at it with your family, uh, and you want to start your own shop because you're eager to support your family, start employing more people, you might have to go through a, a, a ludicrously rigorous licensing regime by the state before you can do that, right? Such that hairdressers are put through an enormous amount of work. Uh, and it makes it really hard for them to have the agency that they need to have to get their businesses started, right? And I think to that extent, removing those sorts of roadblocks to cultivating practices is, I think, a real value. And that is a policy matter. But when it comes to the alienation, the sense of resentment, the sense of disconnect that goes along with being impoverished, that is the sort of thing that I just think has to have a kind of presence uh, 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 with them. I could be wrong about that, but my views on poverty have been dramatically transformed by just living in my neighborhood. Um, and, 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 you know, I live in a, a neighborhood that's um, where the median income is below the federal poverty line. And I play basketball at my local park and I, and I go past houses that are, um, have had fires in parts of them and have never been restored, right? And when I see some of my neighbors uh, who come into my neighborhood, uh, there's a way of living within that community that's actually kind of bad, that's almost too intentional, right? You're there because you want to save them, you're there because you want to, to sort of help the poor. Um, and I think that's its own brings its own set of social problems, but there is something about just being there without the anxiety of trying to save everyone that's massively valuable for social relations. Um, so I, it's entirely accidental that we live there in one way, um, and it's certainly accidental that I've spent as much time hanging out with um, people who have never heard of my home institution as a, as a doctoral, you know, as a PhD. They've just literally, you know, I got a PhD from Oxford. They've never heard of it and they couldn't care less, and it's great, right? It's the most refreshing thing about my life. Uh, it means there is no pressure on me to say anything worthwhile to them. I just get to school them at the game of basketball. And oh, do I ever do that. Um, I'm just kidding, I don't actually. Um, except when I play the kids. Then it's real, right? Like, you know, you've got the six-year-olds who are playing on the court, and so there are three of them, and so you say, look, if you guys score one, you win. Actually, they're more like 10-year-olds, right? And then it's one on three, and all they have to get is one, and yeah, I, I win those games. <laughs> yeah, go Jace. I don't know if that helps. That, I mean, You're, yeah, why would you be concerned about my sporting life? It's fine, Paul. <laughs> Jason, yeah. Um, the question is, what is, what is our calling when the poorest among us are not near us? Um, you know, I do, I do think there is real room for an intentional relocation of our lives into those communities, um, just for the sake of, like, it's interesting. Right, one thing that I really love about the communities that I've been introduced to in playing basketball is how colorful they are. Right, they're like, the, thing, the thing with um, uh, suburban America is it's very bland. Um, and there is a generational interest, right? So Waco's downtown is reviving as younger people are moving into it because there's a recognition that the boastful pride of life which dominates suburban America is fundamentally sterile. It's sterile. And I think naming it as sterile creates an interest or a desire for um, uh, a community that is deeply imperfect and maybe where the imperfections are on the surface, right? And so there is a kind of um, obviousness about what the needs of my neighbor are that weren't 
wasn't there. So in some ways, it's a kind of like easier calling for me, right? Because out in suburban America, you might have to work really hard to find the hidden and invisible needs. And they're really there, right? Like food security. I, I lived in St. Louis, and I talked with a, um, uh, a person who ran a food bank in West County, St. Louis, which is you know out in the suburbs, like middle class, upper middle class area, and she ran the food bank. And she was like, you, have, you would have, like, you would be shocked to know how many of our clients have tract homes with four bedrooms, three baths, and they're insecure about their food because they are so leveraged in debt that they have no money. I worked as a financial planner for a while, and um, I met one couple, God bless them, who were 64, wanted to retire in three years, had no fixed pension, and had saved $15,000, and were putting their son through a master's program. Now, you've enjoyed the luxuries of middle class life at that point but you're toast. And if you look at the savings rates among the suburbs, they're toast. Be prepared to work for a long time to support your parents, right? And if not your parents, the generation of your parents, because they have not saved. And so I think within that, there are lots of needs within those communities, but they're, they're less visible, and they take in that way more time to come to the surface. And so there is a real like ministry to the suburbs that can and should be had. Uh, there's a, a book by a local writer, Ashley Hales, I forget the title of it, but that's on this theme. But I do think that there is a real place, and I'm open to this, for relocation into communities to walk with those in whose needs are obvious and to just be a neighbor. Um, and not everyone can do that. And those who can't, that's great, right? The, the responsibility is to dig to find those needs around us. I, yeah. I have no idea. Um, there, you know, whether or not gentrification can be done uh, justly is a real problem. So. You know, to pick on Magnolia, Chip and Joanna, right? This is a very local talk or local Q&A session for me. But um, Chip and Joanna, if you don't know, uh, have a television show that is, uh, was the most famous uh, rehab, home rehab show in America. It's set in Waco, Texas. And they're terrific. We love them. They've totally re, re, like reinvigorated the city. They've also raised property taxes around the city massively. And they've raised property taxes in places where uh, there are lots of homes that are falling down, which are fixer uppers. Because we've had a lot of people who have seen the massive opportunities in Waco, have sold their $600,000 or $800,000 home in California, bought a hundred. $15,000 home in Waco, spent $200,000 to rehab it, and retired in the home of their dreams. Now that's nice, but the property taxes are just gonna skyrocket as that happens, right? And that creates um, a situation for those who either are renting or own where they're constrained, and it drives them out. One thing I would like to see would be, um, I, I, I will just say this on the record, I would like Chip and Joanna to direct proceeds to a housing relief fund where they supply legal help for, for like people in Waco who have distressed mortgages, where they just pay for it. I would like them to do that. Um, uh, 
they, if they don't do that, uh, there's a legal group that I have been touting to everyone that I would like people to give money to um, who is doing that sort of thing as well. So I think there is a way of saving and rescuing distressed mortgages and, and allowing people to keep their homes even as property taxes go up. It'd be nice to see, for instance, property tax exemptions for people below certain income levels, right? Texas could do that. We could graduate our property tax rates according to, we give exemptions to veterans, we give exemptions to people for a lot of reasons. I think we could have an exemption on property taxes based on like property values and income. We're smart enough, we could figure that out, right? Um, yeah, we're smart enough, we're Texas. We ain't California, we're not <laughs> screwing this up. Um, you're welcome, California. Um, so I think there are ways in which People can live in those communities and move into them. And the other thing is gentrification has some real benefits for those who live in those communities if they own property, right? That I will say, I know someone who really wants to sell his home and he wants to sell his home for great reasons. He's lived there for 20 years, but he has a son who he needs to take care of and is concerned that he can't do it in the neighborhood because his son has massive cognitive disabilities due to a car accident and he's worried about his son wandering out uh, and getting hit by a car. It's a reasonable worry. His son has wandered into my backyard at various points. He wants to sell his house and he wants to sell it at a price which will allow him to move to a place that would be safe for his son. Gentrification is gonna make that possible for him where it never would have been possible before. Right? He's going to get his asking price. Um, and his asking price for the house is, I think, pretty high given the house. And, but that is going to give him the, agent, him the agency that he wants to better his life. So it's, it can be really complicated, but that's one story. In general, it doesn't go as well because people don't tend to own their homes. They rent. And the landlords uh, will sell to people with the means to rehab them and move in uh, more desirable occupants. Yeah, go. Yeah, I, you know, as college students, how can you give to those sorts of efforts or contribute to those sorts of problems? On housing, um, broadly, I think that you can start uh, moving in a direction where you are prepared to contribute to these problems by making your own life uh, present in those communities to the extent that you can, right? Go hang out at the middle school in, um, what's this, Norwalk. I substitute taught my senior year and like Norwalk, it's not all the way down to Compton, right? Like, it's not that. But Norwalk can be pretty rough. And I think there's even, an, like, a weekly presence in uh, a community where these people are really facing these issues can do a lot to make you alive to the need to serve your neighbor. Um, and I think one thing that we should say is the awareness, like the, the, the sense of awareness of our neighbor's needs, um, they're, they're, it's kind of heritable, right? Like it's, it's not a zero sum thing. It's not like if I uh, think about my neighbor's needs with respect to poverty, it makes me inattentive to their needs in other dimensions of their lives, right? Really it's if I'm alive to my neighbor as a person and I'm really considering the needs around them, I'm alive to the task and the vocation that God has set before me in that particular moment and encounter with my neighbor. I mean, college students, many of you should be thinking about what your responsibilities are with your friends with respect to, say, mental health and anxiety and, you know, these sorts of concerns where there are serious needs and deep loneliness. Um, and 
there's real opportunities for the communication of goods that will prepare you to be as attentive and as alive to say the economic challenges when you are brought into that context. Um, so learning to see the needs here where you are is global preparation, right? You'll be ready for the hour when you have to make a housing decision. You'll be prepared. Really, like, I just, this has nothing to do with anything, but really probably you should all pursue justice by taking your iPhones and smashing them on the ground with hammers and never, ever using them, right? Uh, I, you know, I teach at Baylor, God bless them. I walk around campus and all I can think as I see all of the students walking around is that song from Les Mis, look down, look down, don't look them in the eye, look down, look down, you're here until you die. I started that way too low, I wasn't gonna hit that low note, so I had to say that, right? But it really is like, you're in prison to that sucker, right, like that is, you are in jail and you are not alive to your neighbor and their needs as long as you are staring at that sucker, smash it with a hammer, and never, ever watch Netflix. <laughs> Don't do it. Here's my argument against Netflix. Netflix is like the substitute family where you like vicariously encounter these situations which have nothing to do with the real needs of the people around you and you tell yourself, oh, I'm getting wisdom because I'm learning so much by watching Breaking Bad. I'm, I'm like, you know, becoming a better person by this. And it's false. You're taking time away from your neighbor. And the thing is, I've, I'm old now and so I remember the shows that happened 10 years ago. And notice, like, I use Breaking Bad. That shows that I'm old because no one talks about Breaking Bad anymore. No one cares. Unless you're going to be a film critic or a movie critic, zero people in this world care about Breaking Bad. And you will have zero interesting conversations where Breaking Bad is a relevant thing. There is nothing worse than being at a dinner conversation where people have the TV and movies conversation. Oh, have you guys seen this? I've been watching it. It's awesome. I think you'd love it. Oh, that sounds great. Have you seen this one? I did, Stranger Things season three. Oh, the best. It's so good. Oh, so good. And then you're done. <laughs> I hate it. Don't watch Netflix. Be just, love your neighbor, have real bonds with your family and don't have the proxy community of the Stranger Things kids. Just don't do it. There you are. Question up here. <laughs> yeah. So the question is, is the role of the state to provide the goods which people should cultivate? It might depend on which goods. But I think probably not. I think it should judge wrongs where goods are being unjustly deprived from people by others but I don't think it should administratively deliver the goods to people. And you can talk to Matthew Wright about that and he will tell you all the reasons why I am wrong. Because we disagree on just this point. Discover who you're called to be at Biola University, a leading Christ-centered university in Los Angeles with programs on campus and online. Subscribe for more of our videos and learn more at biola.edu.